I'm Suzanne Staggs and I'm from Princeton University and I'm in charge of the detectors and readout for Simons Observatory. I got into this field because uh, I had planned on doing my thesis on in nuclear physics on a measurement of the neutrino mass and uh, the person I was going to work with at my university which was Princeton where I was a graduate student decided uh, to take another job, a very important job elsewhere. And so I went to the chairman of the department and asked him uh, whether he thought it would be okay for me to go um, to a national lab where I had worked before and do my thesis there, but as a Princeton student. And he said, ah, why don't you work with me? And he was the famous David Wilkinson that the WMAT satellite is named after. So that was how I got interested in the CMB kind of a sideways path. And then the irony is that now with using the CMB and Simons Observatory, we're going to get data that is going to help us constrain the mass of the neutrino. So completely different pathway, but came back together. <laughs> so one of the things about Simons Observatory is that uh, to increase its sensitivity to the microwave background, there are a huge number of detectors in the instruments. And so uh, in my part of the research where we're working on the detectors and readout, there's this huge push to make these very robust assemblies that are just as sensitive as the specially sort of handmade um, arrays that we had made in the past. And uh, part of um, what we're doing to make this huge number of detectors possible is using a new kind of readout so that instead of um, reading out just, uh, say, 30 detectors at a time on one pair of wires. Now we can read out 2,000 detectors at a time just on one pair of, of um, coaxial cables. And so that makes uh, all the assembly and use in the cryosets a lot simpler, but it's at the cost of having to develop a new method of doing the readout. And so we're still in a um, research and development phase on uh, that new form of readout which, to be honest, is exactly the phase that most experimentalists love to be in. You love to be pushing the boundaries and doing something that's new. Otherwise, you just feel like you're checking off the box. So in that sense, it's uh, uh, really fun. But it also means that we're uh, everyone is very, very focused and busy <laughs> on getting this aspect of the um, Simons Observatory instrumentation right. And there, there's no law that says you can't expand space-time faster than the speed of light. It, it's just that particles, including light, cannot travel faster than the speed of light. But you can take the whole you know, matrix of which we all exist, and that you can pull apart faster than the speed of light. Inflation, like the general idea with inflation is that the universe was, was in pretty good thermal contact with itself. You know, it, it, it had existed for long enough that that uh, ordinary processes like radiation could have caused all the parts of it to be in thermal equilibrium, so everything at the same temperature. And then all, all of a sudden, um, uh, it's, well, for whatever reason, it starts expanding incredibly fast. And then you take parts of the universe that used to be in this great thermal contact, and you, you take them really far apart so that C times T between them, the universe is only a fraction of a second old. So C times T gives a distance. And they're way farther apart than C times T because of this traveling faster than the speed of light. And then what happens, I love this, is the universe is expanding, right? And, and, but it's also getting older. So that as time goes on, C times T um, is equal to the distance between these two patches. And so you discover this weird thing. You thought that you know, the universe was this really short distance, so there's no way that this part of the universe could have anything in common with this universe. I used to make this joke about how it's like in Europe when they had different train track gauges. You know, when, when a country expanded and expanded and got to its borders and it ran into some other country, they didn't have the same gauge. <laughs> you know, you, you don't naturally have this consistency. And so the really weird thing with inflation that we already know appears to be true is that you can look at two different sides of the universe now and they're at essentially the same temperature. They're at this 2.7 Kelvin background. So 
to really, you know, a few hundred parts per million, they're at the same temperature. And that's the sort of fundamental thing of like, how can that be true? Well, I think the best advice I got when I went to my undergraduate university, which was Rice, a great school, was um, uh, just keep your head down. Just like look down at what you want to be working on and try as hard as you can to learn as much as you can and just quit getting distracted by how, what, by competition. You know, don't keep looking to the side to figure out whether somebody else knows more than you do or compare yourself with other people all the time. I think it's just a big distraction that people get into when they get to college because they're meeting all these new people, especially, especially if you're going to you know, a pretty good school. You're meeting all these people who got into that good school with you. So it can be just a, a distraction and intimidation factor. People will ask really penetrating questions because they're not so caught up in whether other people will think they're dumb if they ask a question. So people just listen, they hear what's said, you know, almost as if it were in a vacuum. They listen to what's said and they interpret whether or not it makes sense to the listener. And then they can ask a question that, that can, you know, clarify things for everybody in the room. We've occasionally had people at Princeton, students or other faculty who do that. And it, it's, it's amazing. And I think the thing is that if you're caught up thinking you're dumber than everyone else, and then you won't even bother asking questions. When probably, you know, there's a really good chance that if you ask the question, three quarters of the room wanted the question asked. Thank you.